Okay, so um, this is a very ambitious title, and I actually uh, have my doubts whether this will ever come true. Um, but I'll try to explain what I'm talking about. So this is Lisa Doll. Lisa Doll is one of the world's greatest Go players. And about two and a half years ago, the New York Times predicted that it would take AI about 100 years before it could beat someone as good as Lisa Doll. Uh, 18 months later, uh, an AI program, AlphaGo, beat Lisa Doll. Um, and since then, AlphaGo has been teaching the human race how to play Go properly. Uh, and we call this a holy cow moment, right? A, a moment when you realize AI is moving quite fast. Um, and that's given people some reason to think about a question. Uh, the question is, what happens if AI succeeds? Um, if we look a little further ahead, uh, just maybe a few years down, down the road, um, we might see a solution to this problem, which is, uh, can machines read? Can they read and understand? We know they can read and translate uh, without understanding, but understanding means being able to combine information from multiple sources, to answer questions, to derive inferences, and so on. Um, when that happens, uh, and I think it will probably happen fairly soon, machines will very quickly have read everything that the human race has ever written. So, um, we could have systems of uh, really incredible uh, knowledge, reasoning capability, uh, planning capabilities, and so on. And because everything we value in our civilization is the result of our intelligence, if we have access to a lot more of it, uh, that represents a step change in our ability to push civilization forward. And we should, I believe, be able to solve many of the problems that our unaided brains uh, are unable to solve. And so many AI researchers believe that success in AI would, would be uh, both the biggest event in human history and the best event in human history. So, why do we see headlines like this? That AI will be the end of the human race. And you know who is uh, talking about this. Uh, not just Elon Musk, but uh, Stephen Hawking, uh, Bill Gates, uh, and so on. But you might ask, well, you know, these aren't really AI researchers, of course. If they did AI, they would know that this is all poppycock, right? This is all nonsense. Uh, OK, so here's a quotation. Even if we could keep the machines in a subservient position, for instance, by turning off the power at strategic moments, we should, as a species, feel greatly humbled. So this was said by Alan Turing in a radio address in 1951. Uh, Marvin Minsky has said similar things. So, it's not just the, the pundits and the famous uh, non-AI researchers, but some of the people who are the pioneers of AI itself. They asked this question, what if we succeed? And this is the answer that Alan Turing gave. Now, if that's the problem, that we just will have machines that are more intelligent than us, um, and then we'll be toast, right? we could call this the gorilla problem. This is the same problem that the gorillas face because a few million years ago, their ancestors uh, decided to create the human race. And here the, here the gorillas are having a meeting to discuss uh, whether this was a good idea. And you can kind of see from their body language that they're not too happy about the human race uh, coming into existence. Now, if that's the problem, right, that you make a, you make a more intelligent species, you know, you become obsolete and then extinct. Uh, if that's the problem, then I think what the human race should do is switch it off now before it's too late. Um, that's very difficult to do, because the value of achieving human-level AI would be greater than the GDP of the entire planet. So when you have that kind of goal that you're working towards, it's very hard to say, okay, Stop, 
right? I don't think that's going to happen. So we have to understand in more depth what is the nature of the problem. Why is making AI better a bad thing? And here's another quote. We had better be quite sure that the purpose put into the machine is the purpose which we really desire. Okay. This, I think, is the real problem. This is a quote from Norbert Wiener in 1960. Norbert Wiener, as many of you know, was a very famous mathematician. He was the father of cybernetics uh, and modern control theory. Uh, and he had just seen an early AI program, Arthur Samuel's checker playing program, uh, learn to beat human players uh, starting from scratch. So what Norbert Wiener is saying is, if you put the wrong purpose into the machine, and the machine is more intelligent than you, uh, then you could face a serious problem. Uh, this is not a new observation. You could say that this is the observation in the legend of King Midas. So King Midas said, I want everything I touch to turn to gold. He got exactly what he asked for. Everything he touched turned to gold, including his drink and his food and his family. And then he died in misery and starvation. Very rich, but still miserable. So this problem uh, means that we have to be extremely careful as machines become more intelligent, we have to be extremely careful in making sure that the purpose we put into the machines is the right one. And there's a second problem, which was pointed out more recently, actually by Steve Omohundro um, just a few years ago, which is that when you give a purpose to a machine, right, when you put an objective into a machine, it doesn't take a very intelligent machine to realize that if someone switches the machine off, it won't be able to achieve the purpose. So even something as simple as fetch the coffee, the machine can reason to itself, I can't fetch the coffee if I'm dead. Right? So this is a very important thing to remember. AlphaGo is extremely good at Go, but it's not a very intelligent system. It actually knows nothing about the real world. It doesn't contemplate the possibility that someone could switch it off. But if there was a branch in its search tree saying, you know, at this point, your opponent could switch you off, right, then you can be absolutely sure that AlphaGo would find a way to avoid that part of the tree right, so that it could win the game. Um, and so what this means is that you have the potential for a machine that's more intelligent than us, that has the wrong purpose, because we didn't put in the right purpose, and which is going to defend itself against any attempt to interfere, to switch it off, to change the purpose. And this is exactly the plot of uh, a very famous movie, 2001, Space Odyssey, where Hal uh, is the computer running the spaceship and gets into a conflict with the humans on board uh, and refuses to accept orders from the humans because those orders conflict with its mission. Right? Now, fortunately, Hal was not super intelligent. Uh, it was pretty smart, but eventually Dave, the one that Hal is talking to here, Dave outsmarts Hal and manages to switch him off. But if Hal had been super intelligent, then Dave would have been the one to be switched off. So this is the problem that we have to figure out a solution for. What we need is what I've been calling provably beneficial AI. So AI systems that even under real circumstances where real people are putting real objectives into machines, we, can, we should be able to prove that the AI system will be beneficial to those humans. Now, when you do AI research, what you're doing is you're setting up a mathematical problem. And we'll assume, well, let's call this problem F, right? What we'll assume is that the machine is going to solve this problem F that we define for it. OK, we'll allow it to solve F arbitrarily well. We'll say we're not going to put any a priori bound on how smart it is. We'll just say it can solve F arbitrarily well. But we get to set up the F in the first place. Right? We get to figure out what is this formal mathematical problem that the AI system is going to solve. If instead we think, OK, the AI system is a black box that arrives from outer space. It's an AGI, an artificial general intelligence. 
if you think that's the problem, then there is no solution, right? If an arbitrarily intelligent system arises from outer space and it doesn't have the same objectives that we do, then uh, it will achieve its objectives and we won't achieve ours. In other words, we're toast. So we have to think about this as a design problem. How do we set up a formal problem which, if the robot solves it arbitrarily well, will still result in behavior that makes us happy? If we can do that, then we can prove a theorem saying the human is better off with the robot. Okay, so that's the goal of provably beneficial AI. And the formal name of the problem that we have defined is called cooperative inverse reinforcement learning. So I'll illustrate what I mean by that. Uh, for those of you who know game theory uh, and who know about reinforcement learning and inverse reinforcement learning, then you already know what that means. So let me illustrate the principles of this. Um, our center at Berkeley is called the Center for Human Compatible AI, which means AI that's compatible with human existence. Um, and there are three simple principles that AI systems need to follow. One is that the robot only really has one objective, right? Which is to maximize the realization of human values, as it's written there. In other words, to make us, make, to make us happy, to make sure that we're happy. So when I say human values, I don't mean some kind of moral code uh, or anything like that. I simply mean uh, to, to maximize the preferences that we have over what life we would like to live. Okay, and there are seven billion of us and there are seven billion sets of preferences uh, about what lives we would like to live. So there is not one moral code. There's just the ability to predict what each person wants. And the key point here is that the robot does not know what those preferences are. The robot is uncertain about the human objectives, the human preferences. Now, if that, so those two principles are very important. If that was all we were going to say, we would have very useless robots. Because if the robots really know nothing about human preferences, they're not going to be able to do anything to help us, right? So they'd be sort of neutral, but not beneficial. Um, so the third principle is that there's some way that human preferences are grounded in evidence. And the evidence is the set of choices that human beings make, right? That those choices reflect in some way their underlying preferences. So let me illustrate this with a very simple problem called the off-switch problem. Um, and so we'll start by doing it the old-fashioned way, right? So here's a robot. This is the PR2 from our lab at Berkeley. Uh, the robot has an off switch, a big red off switch on the back. And if we send the robot to fetch the coffee, right, if we give it the traditional objective, a goal, I must fetch the coffee, the robot says to itself, OK, I can't fetch the coffee if I'm dead. Therefore, I must disable my off switch. And maybe uh, get rid of any potential threats uh, to my coffee collection uh, that might come along. So when you think about it this way, right, it's, it's sort of, it's hard to get around, right? We want to give objectives to machines so they can be useful to us, but when we do it, they start behaving in this really pathological way. Uh, so how do we prevent this kind of behavior? So we'll see that if you follow the three principles, actually, you get quite different behavior. So the robot says to itself, OK, the human being might switch me off. But why would a human do that? Right? Because I'm doing something wrong. Now, because the robot's uncertain about human objectives, it doesn't know what that means. It doesn't know what wrong is. But by the first principle, it knows that it wants to avoid doing anything wrong. It wants to benefit humans but it doesn't know which of its actions may or may not do that. So if it is doing something wrong, it clearly wants to have that behavior interrupted. It wants the human to switch it off to prevent it from doing things that will harm humans. So it will allow the human to switch it off, and its willingness to do that is directly related to its uncertainty about the objectives. In fact, you can do the math, and I'm simulating mathematics by writing it in Greek, uh, you get a theorem, such a robot is provably beneficial. Okay? 
and the robot's incentive to allow itself to be switched off is directly related to the variance in the uncertainty about the human objective. And, and if that uncertainty disappears, the robot becomes pathological. It will no longer allow itself to be switched off. OK, so that's a start. It's an indication of how we might move forward with this. Let me talk about some of the difficulties, right? We talked about the idea that human behavior provides information about human values. And that means that the machine will have to learn for each human which life would that human prefer, and then it has to do some kind of trade-off uh, among multiple people, which AI is not going to solve. We have to talk to the politicians and the moral philosophers to see how they would like to do that, but I might put forward a basic idea that everyone's preferences count the same. Uh, now, there are difficulties, and the difficulties really lie in the connection between human behavior and human preferences. Humans are not rational, and therefore their behavior does not reflect their preferences in the usual way. So in order to invert this relationship, to go from the behavior to the preferences, we have to understand a lot about us, right? About our actual cognition, the fact that we are computationally limited, the fact that we are uh, internally conflicted, um, and various other problems. Now, on the other side, there are reasons for optimism. And, and I, I know we have a lot of entrepreneurs here, and uh, you, you all appreciate the power of the market. So let's look at the economic incentives to solve this problem. Right? If you build a digital personal assistant that behaves like I'm just about to show you, uh, you might run into some problems economically because people wouldn't, wouldn't buy your system or your company would be in trouble. So here's a couple of conversations. First of all, uh, on the left, we have the digital assistant saying, your wife called to remind you about dinner tonight. And of course, you've forgotten. What dinner? What are you talking about? Your 20th anniversary at 7 p.m. And of course, you are in a panic now because you've also made an appointment with the Secretary General at 7.30. I can't do this. How did this happen? Well, I did warn you, but you overrode my recommendation. Um, OK, so what am I going to do now? I can't just tell him I'm too busy. Don't worry. I arranged for his plane to be delayed. Some kind of computer malfunction. Really? You can do that? <laughs> he sends his profound apologies and is happy to meet you for lunch tomorrow. OK, well, so it solved your problem, but it created problems for other people. OK, so it's not quite right, and you might find yourself uh, facing a lawsuit uh, or something like that. So let's fix that. Let's put in other people's preferences as well. Um, and now have another conversation. Welcome home, long day. Yes, terrible, didn't even have time for lunch. You must be quite hungry. Starving, can you make me some dinner? Um, that's something I need to tell you. There are humans in South Sudan in more urgent need of help. I am leaving now. Please make your own dinner. <laughs> right. So I actually trust the market uh, to some extent. I trust you guys, the entrepreneurs, to figure out how to align the preferences uh, of the digital assistant with those of the user and other people in a way that sort of works uh, in a system sense. If we don't get this right, we're going to have a severe problem. Because as the machines, as I said, machines will read everything the human race has ever written, they have a huge uh, amount of information from which they can learn human preferences. So I'm reasonably optimistic that the data is there and the economic motivation is there. And if you don't believe me about the economic motivation, just imagine what happens if you have domestic robots. Okay, not just something on your cell phone, but a real robot uh, in your house that's looking after the kids and the kids are hungry and there's nothing in the fridge. And uh, what's the robot going to do? Well, it sees the cat. And, uh, you know, it doesn't understand that the nutritional value of the cat is not as great as the sentimental value of the cat. And so we have a problem, right? That um, when, when this happens, that's the end of the domestic robot industry. OK? Um, and so we have to get this right. There is no alternative but to getting this right. As AI systems move into the real world of common sense, of reality, of preferences, uh, machines will need to understand uh, all, the, all of these issues correctly. 
So to summarize, if we're going to move forward with AI and make it arbitrarily intelligent, we have to make it safe. We have to make it provably beneficial. Um, and I, th I think we have uh, the beginnings of a solution to how to make that happen based on robots that are purely altruistic, who only want to uh, make humans happy, uh, but are not sure exactly what that means. Now, in the process of doing this, we'll actually learn a lot more about our own preferences. Our own preferences are often implicit. We don't talk about them very much. Pretty much everyone here, I think, likes their own arms and legs. You like having them, right? But how often do you talk about the fact that you like having them? Not very often. There's, you, you probably can't find a book where someone's written down, you know, people like having their own arms and legs. Um, but as we make this information explicit, we will learn much more about what we, really, uh, what we really care about. And I think we'll learn that, in fact, contrary to public opinion, we have an enormous amount in common uh, about our preferences for our future lives. And also, we will see, by example, what happens uh, when you take into account the preferences of everyone rather than just the preferences of yourself. So these two things together may make us better people. Thank you very much.